August 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, 1969. Four to 500,000 people on 300 acres of rural upstate New York countryside. 32 musical acts, a guru, a hippie clown, and two reluctant MCs. Rain, traffic, food shortages, mud, pot and acid, and overflowing porta sands. Two births, two deaths, and a global event that came to represent the dreams and aspirations of an entire generation. That's Woodstock. Welcome to our discussion about Woodstock with our special guests, official photographer uh, for the Woodstock Festival, Elliot Landy, the couple from the Woodstock album cover, Nick and Bobby Erkeline, activist and child of the Woodstock Nation, Rachel Marco Havens, and Museum at Bethel Woods assistant curator, Julia Fell, and a special musical performance by Togi Lama. Hi, I'm Wade Lawrence, museum director and senior curator at the Museum at Bethel Woods, and I'll be moderating tonight's conversation. We've got it set up kind of like a late night talk show. I don't know if I'm Dick Cavett or uh, Graham Norton or John Stewart, I don't know. But uh, we hope you'll enjoy tonight's show. Uh, I'd like to start off by introducing uh, our favorite photographer, uh, Woodstock's own, Elliot Landy, who is the official photographer. coming up, I'll share this with you. That's, uh, who, who shot this photo of you, Elliot? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan shot this one, Elliot. Uh, have a seat. He shot it while we were doing a, a photo session for uh, the cover of the Sandman Post. It's actually the first time I photographed him. So he said, can I borrow your camera? And you don't say no to Bob Dylan. That's true. Um, if, if you're not familiar with Elliot's work, uh, just think of, let's see, Nashville Skyline. Uh, band album cover, uh, the album cover of the band and music from Big Pink. Van Morrison's Moon Dance. A, f a few things you may have seen before. So uh, I'm going to run some slides on the screen behind us. And Elliot, you can um, either comment on the slides or talk about whatever you like. But um, uh, let's let's start with how did you end up shooting Woodstock? I think I began shooting Woodstock. I think that was kind of the beginning of, of something I'm supposed to be doing in life is to share the importance of this event. Um, and uh, why it's important is because it was it was three days of half a million people were peaceful and loving to each other. And we have to figure out, we have to study how they did it and how were they thinking and what kind of mind space were they in, what kind of mindset did the culture encourage them to be in. So um, I, I, I wound up uh, photographing Woodstock uh, because I was living in Woodstock at the time and I had photographed Bob Dylan and the band and um, they were very reclusive and there were no other pictures of them and everyone was very interested, certainly in Bob Dylan in those years. And uh, Woodstock became somehow the a mysterious music mecca. It was like the apex of American, uh, the future of American music, or the, the essence of American music, uh, both the past and the, and the future at the same time. And so my pictures were identified with that. And um, I met Mike Lang, who's one of the four producers of the festival, just in town casually before he was anything to do with the Woodstock Festival. Uh, we were introduced, and we used to say hi to each other and hang out on the village green. And uh, uh, one day uh, I got a phone call, and he said, uh, can I come over and talk to you for a minute? And he, so he, he came over to my house and on his motorcycle, and he said, I'm producing a festival. Would you like to photograph it for me? And I said, who's playing? And he told me some names, I don't remember which names. And I said, sure, that sounds great, I'll do that. And he said, okay, I'll call you. And he got on his motorcycle and he rode away just as quickly as I'm telling it practically. And uh, I say that in those years, we didn't even shake hands on it. It was just, you said it and I agree, and that was a deal. So that's why I came to for that. How long before the festival was that? Was that uh, like in the spring sometime? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, yeah, it could have been in the spring. Uh, it was warm, he was riding his motorcycle, so that means it wasn't winter. 
and, true, and yeah. shooting events like this in 1969 is a lot different from today. Today, with digital photography, uh, you don't have to think about how many photographs you're taking. Uh, did you bring a whole brick of film, or what, what, what were your supplies yeah. like? Well, I had, um, I brought 80 rolls of film with me, 40 rolls of color, and 40 rolls of black and white. In those years, the technology of publishing, of printing photography, didn't allow color photographs to be reproduced as black and white very easily. So photographers that were photographing for publication had to shoot color and black and white simultaneously. So that's what I did. So I had 40 rolls of color, 40 rolls of black and white, two Leicas, two Nikons, two exposure meters, and a, a whole lot of heavy, heavy baggage around my shoulders because of all this equipment. With all that equipment, were you worried about the rain? What, what happened when it rained? Have you got a picture? Have you got that picture I took while it was raining? Uh, I've got a couple of rain pictures in the slideshow. Uh, I don't know if it's here because I don't know if it's too well. Um, I had uh, full stage access. Uh, I, uh, the producers told the stage people, let them on stage anytime they want to on stage. So, so I was on stage whenever I wanted. So when it started to rain, I was concerned about my camera since right. And so I went under the stage and I, I was just looking out at the rain, very dry. And there was no wind down here either. And uh, I accidentally, I had a, um, one of the cameras I used at Woodstock was called a Wide Lux. And that's a camera that has a lens that rotates like this. So you get a, a panoramic shot of it. By accident, when I was under the stage, I pressed the shutter. So, so that's the only picture I have to, uh, from when I was under the stage. And, and the other month or so, I realized that how, how really interesting that here I was under the stage at Woodstock while it was raining and didn't even think to take a selfie. <laughs> uh, and it's really interesting because that's the last thing in the world anybody would forget to do now in, in that same situation. But I took it by accident, so I don't have a picture of me, but I've got a picture. I can't show it to you. It, 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 I, think it's, I think it's in my book, yeah. <laughs> it's just a picture of stairs and, and you see the rain outside and so on. When, when Michael asked you to photograph, uh, did it seem like it was just to, uh, for posterity, for promotion after the fact of the festival, or, or was there some publication in mind? No, there wasn't any specific publication. Uh, he just asked me to photograph it. There was no explanation needed. It was like an obvious thing. We kind of did things. In the 60s, it was like that. It was very casual. And when somebody you trusted or somebody you felt comfortable with suggested something, you went with it. Okay, that's good. I did ask who was playing. I wanted to be sure that uh, what I was committing to, but and it was a deep commitment at the time. It wasn't like maybe I'll do it when I said I was going to do it. I meant it. He knew I meant it. And a few months after that, he called up and he he, he uh, drove me over to to, uh, to Wallkill to photograph what we thought was going to be the site. So I have pictures of Michael at Wallkill and so on. Um, but it, I don't know. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> Let's, let's uh, invite somebody else up to the stage now. Um, the, the photography that you did at Woodstock, uh, obviously there were, you were not the only photographer at Woodstock. It was one of the most heavily documented events in, in modern history, I think. Uh, all the news media, uh, the, the, the film uh, documentary group, but 20, 20 people with cameras, handheld cameras. So it was well documented. Um, uh, did you have, uh, before I get to the next, Folks, uh, another question came up. Uh, what kind of relationship did you have with any of the other photographers? Did you know the other photographers? I don't think so, actually, now that you mention it. Of course, I have pictures of some of the other photographers now that just happen to be in the picture. No, I really didn't know anyone else. That's okay. a good question. Because uh, I, I know today it's kind of like a fraternity. Uh, everybody knows everybody, and you go to these conferences, and you're all, all good friends now. Well, photography of music in those years was not so well published as it is today. It was really a rare thing to do almost. I started my photographing at the Fillmore East in, in New York City, the Anderson Theater across the street from it right before that. And there were very few photographers there. And we went, for instance, when Janis Joplin was playing, I went easily backstage and up to the dressing room. No one even asked me any questions or stopped me. I took pictures of them. And it was very, 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 a very informal, very casual, and nobody was worried about anything. Nobody cared about what you did with the pictures, and 
nobody wanted social media on it. They were just doing what they were doing, and they let photographers do what photographers do. Well, that raises the obvious question. How in the world did you get Bob Dylan to be comfortable enough with you to allow such access that you had to Bob Dylan? I didn't try and make him comfortable, I think is the best thing. I didn't try any, to do anything. I let him be who he wanted, who he was. I let him do what he wanted to do. I didn't tell him to stand here, to stand there. And I just, um, when, okay, here's a little bit of the story. Um, I met the guy who was introducing us in Woodstock. I drove up from New York where I was living, and he drove me up to Bob's house, and he said, stay here a minute. He got out of the car, and he went into, into uh, the house, and he comes out a few minutes later with Bob following him up, up the driveway to meet me. So Al, as soon as Al Arano says, Bob, this is Elliot, Elliot, this is Bob, and he scoots in the car and drives away, leaving me speechless, actually, 10 feet away from the most famous musician in the world, practically, certainly the most mysteriously missing person no one had seen in a long time. And he just picked up his guitar and started playing, sat on a tire. I didn't tell him what to do, he just did all this, and, and I started taking pictures, being very aware of what a special moment it would be for anyone it, it, to be 10 feet away from him singing and playing. And I thought to myself, but it feels normal. So I didn't feel any, any nervousness about it. I, of course, I was nervous that I would get a good picture. And so I think that's how I got him to be, to be, uh, to be so open, is that I didn't push him. I also didn't want anything, but the only thing I wanted was to get a good picture. I didn't think about selling it, I didn't think about my career, I didn't think about meeting him. It was just, I was focused on the photography, if you don't mind, the, pun, the double entendre. And how long did that working relationship work on uh, last? We, we did the Saturday Post probably about two years, I think, was the next time. I mean, I saw him, I went, um, I came, my, my system is to take pictures and then show it to the people I'm taking pictures for. So I went back to the city where I was living. I came up the next weekend with the process pictures, or maybe it was during the week. We went over them. And uh, during that time, I was, I was also photographing the band or close to them. And they had said to me, anytime you want to stay in our house, just come over. This is Rick and Levon. Come on over and sleep over. So I told Bob, after showing him pictures uh, that we had taken, that I was going to go stay at Levon's house. And he said, oh, you can stay upstairs. We have a room upstairs. So, so that was quite interesting. And then the next day, he asked me to photograph him and his family and so on. But it was nothing I, the fact that I didn't want to do it, the fact that I was just receptive, very feminine vibration, let's call it, rather than a masculine who's controlling things, I did the opposite of that. I am that way, I hope, <laughs> anyway, in, in some circumstances. Uh, certainly when I photograph, I am. I'm very receptive when I photograph. I think that's what we're talking about here. Um, so I was just very receptive. To what he wants to do over. <laughs> you got to do a sleepover. Um, now, uh, I, 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 we're going to pivot a little bit here. There was another photographer at uh, Woodstock. Oh, what? Oh. Uh, another photographer at Woodstock by the name of Burke Buzzell. Uh, was he working for Life magazine at the time? Uh, he was a member of Magnum. I don't Magnum, think they were right. on assignments or anything. And uh, he took a photo that you've probably all seen before. Uh, that's the whole picture there. You recognize the uh, couple from the cover. Nick and Bobby Urkeline, come on up. Yeah. While we're walking up, I think we have another happy birthday to sing. Uh, it's Bobby's birthday today. <laughs> so if I was 20 at the Woodstock Festival, how old am I now? We won't tell. We won't ask. Always. So, um, I, I, it's, it's a pleasure to have Nick and Bobby up here. They have been uh, the most uh, genuinely nice and fun people to know over my uh, what, 11, 12 years at Bethel Woods. Um, and they volunteer at the museum uh, on, on show days. They drive the golf cart to give uh, uh, Carlos Santana and whoever else the tour of the historic site. So, and 
the bands actually ask for them, which is pretty cool. It's a great retirement gig. <laughs> so, so the two of you, absolutely, the two of you, tell us, tell us your story. How did you end up on the cover of the album? Somebody threw a dart at that picture. Microphone. <laughs> Somebody threw a dart at that picture, and that's how it ended up. I, we don't know. We obviously don't know. We didn't know they even took that photo. Right? We hadn't planned on going to the concert. Um, however, living in Middletown, we were very privy to all the media, the post, the pre-media, when it was going to be in Walkville, New York. When it finally was happening that Friday night, we were listening to the radio, W-A-L-L, -L, mm -hmm. and they said, oh, they were so excited. So we were excited, and they yeah. said, boy, if you plan on coming, do not come. It's impossible. We were 20. We had to go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, we did not have tickets. Um, the three-day event was $18. The... Um, Minimum wage is $1.60 an hour. Right. So it, it, it took a lot of money to get there. You know, you figure a couple of days' wages to go to see a concert. It's like, eh, I don't know if we wanted to go. It was right in our neighborhood, right next door, until they, they changed it, chased it out to Bethel. Um, we were fortunate to get there. Uh, our friend, or my friend, my high school friend, and became Bobby's friend, uh, James Corcoran, who we actually call Corky, um, was a United States Marine and had just mustered out, spent a tour in Vietnam, and I always referred to him as a two-legged music Bible. And when the album came out, he had to have it. So, going back a little bit, uh, he didn't even have a car. Nobody had a, well, nobody had a car at the time, I don't think, because we lived in the middle town, we didn't need it. So he borrowed his mother's 1965 white Chevrolet and Palace station wagon. It was about 40 feet long. It was a lanyard, it really was. <laughs> white with a red interior, bright red interior. You couldn't miss it. And uh, <clears throat> so we decided we we're going to go up s Friday or Saturday morning because I didn't have to work that night. I was a bartender in Middletown uh, called Dino's Bar and Grill. College bar, we get 800 kids in, and we did. We always had the latest groups of the day, the Brooklyn Bridge, Starby Alarm Clock, and, and whatever. And I met Bobby the February before the concert. Um, she was dating one of my waiters, and the waiters used to station the girls, their girlfriends, in front of their wait of the bartenders so that they could see them all night long. Well, he introduced me to her, and he said, "Would you do me a favor? Keep an eye on her." <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> and that's how we met. <laughs> right? However, to get back to the question. We have no idea how that picture coming down the cover. Uh, we've got the picture back up again. Uh, isn't that Corky on the right-hand side of the screen? It's, it's, yeah, to the extreme. Yeah. Yes. Our Corky, um, our Corky passed away in September. Agent Orange-related disease. I knew him more than 50 years. Nick knew him way longer than that. And when I look at that picture and I see the young couple, us, Kind of representative of the Woodstock generation, and then I see our Marine who had just come back from Vietnam. It, it gives it a whole different feeling to me. It um, it exemplifies the peace that we experienced at Woodstock under less than perfect conditions. Yeah, it's 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 a tough thing to lose a good friend after after all that time. Um, but I, I I persevered through with the memories and the great memories that we had together. We had a lot of fun um, through the years. Um, he he was what I described as I think I said before he's a two-legged music pilot. So what happened um, after the concert? He went out and bought the album the first day it came out, and we all got together at his apartment and he was playing the music on the uh, turntable and we were passing the jacket around amongst the people that we were with and the other people were there. So as you're looking at this album, you're not looking at the album cover, you open up the jacket and you're looking in the middle and you're looking at the crowd because you didn't really realize it, well you realized how much people there but you couldn't really appreciate it because you're looking at the crowd in the middle of the jacket from the performer's perspective. And Today, when we do the artist tours, that's the first we, thing we show the performers when they are on the tour with us. We open up the jacket and we say, 
Can you imagine coming on stage and seeing this? And so they all just drop their jaw. It's like, you can't believe it. Maybe they want to go back and smoke another joint or something before they come back on. I don't know. But it's kind of funny. Um, but it's amazing. So anyway, so they flip it over in the back to see who's playing, who's, what music, uh, what musician, what the songs are on the back of the, the, the album. And finally, somebody, we've, somebody flipped over the album, looked at the, the front of it to see this photo. And then what happened? At first, it was like, Whoa, that's us. And we were excited. We were. I mean, that, that was pretty special. But now, mind you, Woodstock had been over maybe three, four, five, six months. I don't know, by the time the album came out. So our, our excitement was brief. We were excited to tell our friends. And they were like, whoa, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Where do you want to go for dinner? I mean, it was no big deal back then. However, I thought maybe then I should tell my mother that I went. <laughs> oh. Elliot, did you have something to add to this? Yes, um, the question of how that wound up on the cover. Um, Burke Uzzel was a photographer with the agency Magnum Photographers, a very special agency founded by Cartier Bresson to make a fine art photography and photojournalism the same thing. And uh, another Magnum photographer, Charles Harvey, also went. So they went together kind of as a pair. And um, after the festival, Magnum somehow found out about my photographs and they contacted me because they needed someone who would photograph from the stage and the musicians. So uh, Magnum then distributed my photos and Burke's and Charlie's together. So they, one of their clients was Atlantic Records. So, so that's how they saw your picture. From also to Life Magazine, the special issue of Life Magazine as well. So, so that's how they got the, to see it in the first place. So that's how we got on the cover. <laughs> and, and I think it was probably, what, the 25th or the 40th? What, what anniversary was it when the world discovered you? Um, it was at the 20th anniversary. I didn't know I needed to be discovered. <laughs> Up until the 20th anniversary, um, you didn't hear too awful much about Woodstock. And if you did, um, a lot of people remembered it with um, the devastation that was left behind in Sullivan County. After about 20 years, folks started to look at the event a little differently. And it was at that time that Life Magazine was going to do a 20th anniversary issue. And in our little local newspaper, Times Herald Record, they put a coupon in, um, canvassing for anyone who still lived in the area that had attended the festival. They would like to hear your stories. So I filled out the coupon, I mailed it back to them, and months later, they called. I didn't even remember filling out the coupon. Um, we talked, probably half an hour, but I didn't mention the picture until just as we hung up. The very next day, they sent Bill Eckridge, the photographer that took the photo of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. He came to our home to take a picture for the magazine. We were busy. We had two little boys. We had two little league games we had to go to, and we had to go to church. So Bill came with us to the little league field and the church. And then he came back to our home, and he spent maybe eight hours with us. Once our picture was in the magazine, that's when we were reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, I had to be a business representative for the Carpenters Union down in Rock County at the time, and we had a, uh, a PR person who caught wind of it and decided he was going to put it on the AP wire. And he did. And, and the very next moment after he did that, um, and I think I was away at a conference someplace, my poor wife woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning with a phone ring. 4 a.m., excuse me. 4 a.m., yeah. With, uh, and she would hang the phone up, and it would. As soon as she hung it up, it would ring. As soon as she hung it up, it would ring. How many did you did you write down? There were phone calls from all across the country, from uh, newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, individuals that read about us. I tried to document, and I got upwards to probably close to a couple hundred. I just couldn't keep up with it. That's a one day. That, and I just couldn't get downstairs. Is that that? <laughs> and I was like, 
what the heck? Look what you left me with, Nick or Klein. <laughs> I have to say, also, part of the devastation uh, that... Phone's that, ringing again. Pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear that. <laughs> it's not mine, no. <laughs> um, part of the de devastation that happened was actually uh, during the... Uh, was during the concert itself. And you can witness it as you walk in. Um, you're in the country. You're in the mountains. There's no uh, Dunkin' Donuts on the corner. There's no McDonald's over there. There's no general store. There's no place to get water or anything to drink. There's no place to go to the bathroom. There's nothing. You're in the woods. And it's 95 degrees out, 100% humidity, and you've got to walk five miles, six miles, 10 miles, or wherever you got to go. I mean, our car stopped in Wordsboro on the way to the site. In Wordsboro, it was blockade, a block, roadblocks. They just had a block, and the people pulled the cars off and pitched their tents in the medium of Route 17. That's about 30 miles away? 25, it's about at least 25, yeah, 30, whatever. And uh, so we were fortunate enough to know we were kids that we lived there, so we knew the back roads, and that's really how we got to the site, as far as we could get. Um, but, <laughs> I'll give you the front story. We parked this van yacht. Yeah. Tell me what I'm stumped up. Well, I, I, we finish this one up, and I want to Okay, right, we got as far on. as we could. We parked the land yacht next to a state police car. We got out, and we looked at each other. There's a, there's a young man sitting on the hood of the car, trooper car, wearing uh, blue jeans and moccasins. That's it. Smoking a joint. <laughs> now, if you recall back in 1969, if you got caught with a joint, you could go, you'd go away for five years. That's, that's how strict it was. And there was a trooper, like... 10, 15 feet away from it. We looked at each other and went, what the hell's going on here? This is crazy. <laughs> but as we walked in, and again, don't forget, there was no, no place to eat or go to the bathroom or anything. Kids were raiding the, the vegetable gardens. It's the middle of August. The tomato plants or the tomatoes are, are, are ripe. The Not to mention the feed corn in the field across the way. Everything, everything. And there's no place to go to the bathroom. So if you saw a barn or whatever, you went behind it. Um, and there, I mentioned there's nothing to get to drink. So I, I remember, um, some homeowners would bring the garden hoses out to the road and let the kids get their fill of water before walking in. Some were um, giving away for free, others were charging 25 cents to get their fill. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I remember. And there's other things I remember walking into. That was great. Uh, let's, let's pivot one more time. And you, you're, you were 20 years old at the time, both of you 20? Yeah. Uh, young people. You had your lives ahead of you. You had a friend that had just gotten back from Vietnam. Uh, so you were aware of the situation in the world. You, you know about hopes and fears for the future. Uh, you knew what you wanted from the world, or at least you were figuring it out. Uh, just like half a million other kids on that field were trying to figure out what they wanted, what they expected from the world, what they, where their place was. Um, today's youth, uh, our, our exhibit at uh, the Museum of Bethel Woods, this year's special exhibit is called We Are Golden. And one of the themes of that exhibit is what was the mindset in 1969 of the 18 year olds and the 20 year olds? What is that mindset of the 18 and 20 year olds today about the world? Are the hopes and fears and dreams the same? Are they different? Are there parallels? And I'd like to introduce right now uh, Rachel Havens, uh, Rachel Marco Havens, uh, activist and um, child of the 60s, child of the 70s, actually. And Julia Fennell, assistant curator at the Museum of Bethel Woods. The reason I'm bringing both of you up here at the same time is because for that exhibit, you worked closely together on uh, gathering the information about those oral histories, about what young people today want from the world. Uh, Rachel, why don't you launch off with your experience with working with young people today and what, what's going on with the young people? So, hi everybody. I'm, um, there's probably a question as to why I'm here. Who's Rachel Marco Evans? And it's a hard one because I don't usually sit on panels about subjects like what happened at the Woodstock Festival. Um, I was born uh, 
basically in Woodstock. I was raised in Woodstock. I've spent a lot too much time in the town where it didn't happen. Um, and I was born uh, five days after my father stepped on the stage and kicked off that festival. And, um, and that's a strange place to be as a young person coming up, um, you know, reaching for your own legacy, reaching to make your own um, mark on the planet and to live in the town that pretty much considers themselves the biggest fans of your dad. Um, it's a pretty wild and intense place and it's also an intense place to raise a young person who is working to create their own musical legacy. And, um, and, I, and so I was raised in the counterculture. I was, um, I, I grew up in a metaphysical bookstore and a health food store. And, um, and now as I'm reaching 50 and looking out into this world, I keep going, wow, like I was not raised in America. I wasn't raised in America. I was raised in a utopian mirage. Really. It was a mirage. It really wasn't, you know, uh, um, it, 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 was, uh, it was a great place to grow up 40 years ago um, when there was a mother on every corner and we lived in community. Um, I can't really talk about what happened at Woodside Festival, but I can tell you that um, it was pretty wild for the kids that were born of that generation. Um, we had a lot to contend with. Um, we had really idealistic parents, and we also had a really big mess to clean up. Um, and, um, and it was a lot. And so I spent most of my young years kind of focusing on myself and focusing on um, deep inner work. I spent my 20s in the Tibetan Buddhist monastery, and, um, and I wasn't really thinking um, socially, social justice, environmental justice were not topics um, in my uh, personal reality. I was pretty much just trying to exist, um, w fairly marginalized, because uh, in Woodstock we weren't raised um, with things like um, a home to return to when, uh, when you get out of high school. Um, we, we, it was a, Woodstock itself was a single mom town. So it's kind of hard to believe, but you know, after New York, after, after the 60s, dads went to New York and mom stayed in Woodstock. Judy Bloom wrote a book called The Divorce Bus. That was us. Five o'clock on Friday, man, there was like, half of that bus was full of us kids going to see our dads. So this like wild sort of, how do we come up because we're raised in the garden. We were, I was raised in the garden. Elliot, actually, was my first vegan. You poured the first bowl of, of cereal with apple juice on it that I ever ate. And most of the kids that were coming out of suburbia thought we were weird. You know? That's true. I have another surprise for you, because I didn't know we were brought up in this metaphysical health food bookstore. What do you mean? But I began. I, I was I in, the, in the health food center. No, I'm just saying. Health food store. We weren't there. I mean, I, I, left the, I left Woodstock, came back in 1977. So yeah. I missed, yeah? No, you well, didn't. Well, maybe I'm forgetting. What's the health store center was there? It's still, it was there until 1994. No, what, I mean, and I was there selling you your vitamins. And in, the, and in Woodstock at that time, people rolled in and they brought their pendulum and they'd have three bottles. Here's the phosphatidylcholine. Which one is it going to be? And then they would stand there and they would hang the pendulum over. I mean, that was what was normal to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, 50 years late, 45 years later, my community was, um, the Hudson Valley actually, your community too, if you live in this neighborhood, was um, in jeopardy of a massive water bottle, water grab by a bottling company. And it called me to stand up. And because I have a big voice, I decided to use it and I said, Woodstock is a little town with a big voice, and I started to shout from it. And the people around me were really, most of them, because we've been quite gentrified, and there's, I see actually a long-time Woodstocker in the audience, um, there's not as many of us left. And so what starts to happen in times like this is you really meet the nimby attitudes of your neighbors and yourself. And for me, it was myself. And I went, OMG, I, 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 here I am standing up because my neighborhood's in jeopardy. 
And I stood up and the young people started to come. And suddenly my, one of my best friends in the world was 22 years old and we were fighting off a massive corporate water grab and we did it in five months with the support of incredible women who, um, and, and the whole community, but really it was like this powerful group of women and young people that stood up to stop this water grab. And all of a sudden they went, oh my God, extractive industry. Whoa, fossil fuels. And the kids are going, hey Rach, fossil fuels. Do you know what, and all of a sudden I'm hearing, like everything started to open up to me because the young people stood up and started to wake me up. And so instead of looking inward, or trying to like turn my psychic eye, you know, my third eye inside out. Like I had to flip it out and go, what is going on out here? And the young people, you know, I'm looking in this audience right now and I don't see as many young people as I would love to see, but they're not necessarily thinking about Woodstock in the same way. They are living way more than um, the quote unquote millennials are getting credit for. Some of my best friends are suing the federal government right now for climate negligence. They're not even 21, right? That's what I was going to ask. Right? How old are they? They're 23 to like nine, <laughs> right? And they are in court right now, where they were last week at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, taking, you know, dismissing uh, probably three or four times the government, Trump's government had been dismissed, trying to dismiss this case, they were called back to the court. Another one of our, our friend, my dearest friends ran, and quite a few of them, from North Dakota to Nebraska and back. They ran from North Dakota to Washington, D.C., and they started the Standing Rock evolution. So while people are, um, are kind of really quick to look at the young people and say, you guys don't know what it was like. Actually, this girl right here has less of a future than any of us did when we were her age. And it's up to us to actually stand here and not pass the torch, but hold it together. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> and, so, and so when this wonderful man called me and said, hey, we're doing this exhibit. Actually, I ran into him at my father's um, exhibit at Bethel. He said, hey, Rach, we're doing this thing. I said, uh, uh please, I have voices for you. And so I started to call all these incredibly young people and say, come on, this is a really cool opportunity for you to have your voice shared. And then I was introduced to Julia, and Julia really took it. I just did a few interviews, maybe 10 or 12, about seven or eight of them made it in, and those kids' voices are being shared right now to people all over the world who come to Bethel Woods to have a bit of that Woodstock experience. And what is so important and so um, incredible for me is that when I walked in there, I went, I was there three weeks ago, with the youngest member of the We Are Golden exhibit, who's nine years old, and she had some of the hardest calls of any of the kids that I saw. And, and, and when she was asked, what are you going to, what can you learn from your elders? And she said, I'm gonna learn from their mistakes. She's eight years old and she's fighting a fossil fuel nightmare, a pipeline, 42 inch frack pipeline that's going right, went right across the Hudson River and is 105 feet from a nuclear power plant called Indian Point right there, flowing right now. We have nine-year-old children holding down the fight. It's so important for us to join those fights, to keep in those fights, to honor those fights, and honor that there are young people holding it down. And so I'm passing it off to you, and I know I've talked too long, but I, but I um, it, at this point right now, it, I think I stand kind of at this bridge position where I remember what it was like to be a teenager I also am feeling like the stiffness of age, <laughs> and, I, and not just in my body, like also in my thinking that I know it all. And so I, I'm kind of sitting here going like, where do we go, how do I not let go, and how do I not put too much pressure on you, and how do I not be mad at you guys, for leave, you know, and, and, and how do I not be mad at myself, and I'm not gonna drink that bottled water if I don't have to. 
And, and Julia, as you get the microphone, you notice what's on the screen up above, mm -hmm. uh, the, the oral history part of the special exhibit. Um, and you can talk about what we did there, but what you did there. And also that cues up uh, one of the interviews that Rachel did for us. Right. I want to start off by saying how much of an honor it was to work with Rachel in this exhibit. I mean, she's, the work she does is so inspiring, and the voices that she gathered for us were really incredible. We, we couldn't have got some of those unique perspectives without her, so thank you, Rachel. Um, <laughs> yes, give her, give her a round of applause, too. Uh, so just to give a little bit of information about what we were trying to do and, and what we ended up accomplishing with this. Um, basically, from the beginning of this exhibit, we wanted to bring in authentic voices. Um, we wanted to celebrate the legacy of Woodstock. We didn't want to just show only artifacts, which are they have their place and are very important, but we wanted to bring in authentic perspectives. So we knew that we were going to be bringing in voices of the, the Woodstock generation, of people who who had attended the festival and were young in the 60s. Um, but one of our overarching goals and one of my personal um, passions in the museum field is connecting things to today and, and telling people stories today that connect with what happened 50 years ago. Um, so we decided to also bring in an element of the stories of people who are young today and ask questions that, will, that would parallel with what we knew um, people were talking about uh, with their experiences in the 1960s. So we developed this idea to work with, uh, with Rachel and a couple of other oral historians to gather these voices and ask the young people what were their hopes, what were their fears, and what were their expectations for today. Um, and that was, that was kind of it. We didn't want to guide it too much. We didn't want to have any preconceived notions. Um, we thought for a while, okay, what are the major issues of today? We have to represent you know, women's march or you know, what have you. And then we thought, Let's not do that. Let's go out and just ask, what are you scared of? What are you hopeful for? What do you want from the world? Um, and we did that, and it, it was amazing, the stuff that we, we got back. Um, some of it was very parallel to the 1960s, like we expected. Some of it was very unique to 2019, like we expected. But um, the content itself and the eloquence and the wisdom that we discovered from um, a nine-year-old, the youngest participant, and we, we went up to age 30, this range of people of different ages, different geographic locations, different races, gender, sexualities, we tried to get a really diverse group. And what we, what we found was really incredible, and I don't think I can really give you good, I mean, we're gonna watch a clip to show you kind of an idea of what we got, but if you get a chance to actually experience the exhibit and watch all the clips, you'll just be moved by just the incredible minds that these young people have that I'm so glad to be able to bring those voices and counterpoint to really also equally incredible and moving things that were being said by people who were young in the 1960s. Ready for the clip? Mm -hmm. Well, really, my vision and just really my hope for the future is just to have, you know, the future be heard, the younger generation to be heard and to be recognized and to be taken seriously and to involve them in com a lot of conversations that are being had about our future that we aren't involved in or don't, we, don't even, we don't even know about. My hope is to bring, in each conversation, have the youth represented and to have our voice heard and just to have our input on how and what we want the future to look like. Um, young people are constantly struggling to find a voice and find a standing in the world where they can leave their footprint to for younger generations to help motivate them and to be there for each other generationally, um, just passing that torch and just being able to say, you know, that we were here, you know, we have sacrificed a lot for a lot of movements to get to where they are now, to be recognized, to have, you know, their voice being heard, to, you know, be heard in general vocally. And, you know, in the future, there's going to be a lot more struggle. There's going to be a lot more people fighting for their rights, fighting for things that aren't available, available to us right now. And just to move, a, move through those barriers and knock them down one at a time and just to support each other in that. Because a lot of people don't support, you know, the indigenous movement, the grassroots movement, and even the youth movement of what we want 
our future will look like. I mean, that's going to take a lot of work to make that happen. And to be able to support each other when nobody else is there for you. And throughout the world, you see a lot of young people sacrificing a lot for things that they believe in. The older generation can learn a lot. Uh, they have a lot of wisdom about the past, which is very vital to our survival for the future, and that's history, that we want to carry on to the future, just being embodied in us, but they can learn a lot from us, because moving between this modern world and knowing where we came from, we can see both sides of the story. We can understand and think of new ideas, new innovative ideas that works for us now, and to have us being supported by elders would be a very monumental thing. To have our elders stand behind us and say we agree. You know, we we may not know about this new world, but you do. You're gonna have to live in it. And have them, you know, stand by us and encourage us and be there for us. And to know that when they're gone, that their community, that their families, that even this plan will be taken care of to be part of that conversation. We can learn a lot from you and you can learn a lot from us. You know, we want to listen, we want to learn. And some elders feel like we won't understand that we live in a different time, and we do. But we want to learn, we want to understand so we can tell our future this is what your descendants will understand where you come from in your story. And so we can pass that along to what you contribute to this movement throughout your life throughout you as a young person, what you contributed to our history. You contributed something. You made it possible for us to be here. You made it possible for us to walk between worlds. You made that possible. And we are so thankful for that, and we want to know. Um, I'm gonna cry, I'm crying. This, this was one of your interviewees. That's um. Jacelyn Charger. She was one of the several young people who ran to DC from Standing Rock to call uh, attention to the Dakota Access Pipeline. She started the International Indigenous Youth Council on the ground at Ocheti Shikomi, and she is, mark that woman's name, remember that face, that is a spiritual leader coming up before you. And I'm, I have the chills right now. Thank you for sharing that because her voice, the young people's voice, that, that's, that's the point now. Speaking of young people, I don't know what time it is. Uh, we, we'll wrap it up in just a second, but I just wanted to also mention that um, we gave the assignment to Rachel to interview the young people that she's been working with and several other oral historians we gave the same mandate to. And we specifically said, we don't want these to be professional studio interviews. Uh, we want young people communicate through social media. Use your phone and record this interview, because this is how young people communicate today. This is how we want to communicate now. Uh, I think it worked very well. So uh, thank you very much for the contribution. Uh, Elliot. So what I was trying to say is that the bookstore and, and the health food store that Rachel grew up in, as she put it. Um, when I was um, living in Woodstock in 1969, 1970, I was finished with doing rock and roll photography, and I found out about metaphysical spiritual books, and I felt, wow, I didn't even know this way of thinking existed. People have to know about this. So I began a metaphysical bookstore that was upstairs uh, in the middle of town and so on. And then when I left Woodstock, the owner of the health store downstairs bought the metaphysical bookstore from people I gave it to. And then so it became the health bookstore and metaphysical bookstore. And my feeling in those years was that the way to, how can we evolve as human beings, as a society? And for me, that kind of thinking, spirituality, not religious thinking, but spirituality, metaphysical thought, everything that is, in, is embodied in is multiple books on it now, or from it anyway. So that's the direction that I went into. And I feel that that's how we can evolve as a society through, through what basically the essence of religion is to get in touch with yourself. But there are other ways to do it than to organize religion. Um, yeah, uh, Julia. Oh, there's a microphone on my face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, actually, I have two more quick things to add. Um, the, the youth oral histories that I spoke about earlier, I wanted to mention that actually the team that helped us produce those videos were also a team of young people from the Rochester Institute of Technology. So not only were the young voices being heard through the video, but the kiosks that they were played on were built by this team from RIT, and the videos themselves were edited and produced by that group. So um, we thought that was really important to have them involved in that way and have their editorial um, you know, process involved as well. And uh, the, the one final thing I want to say that Jason really just beautifully put, and I just want to reiterate from a curatorial standpoint, that we were going for that intergenerational communication um, not only just to have the, the Woodstock generation on this side and the youth on this side, we really wanted to draw those parallels and encourage people who are viewing the exhibit and who are leaving with their families or going back to their families and their friends to continue that conversation and really open up that dialogue. Which leads us to the big question, and maybe one or two of you can answer this, um, and we'll uh, circle back around to Woodstock. It was three days of peace and music, but it affected half a million lives in one way or another. Some may have just said, wow, was that muddy, I never want to do that again. And for others, uh, it may have changed their entire trajectory for the rest of their lives. Uh, what did it mean then, and is it still relevant today? Uh, Elliot, you and I have talked about this on a number of occasions. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Rachel, I'd like to hear what you have to say too. Hell no. <laughs> well, for me, Woodstock was an example that a utopian experience can exist in very difficult conditions and, and very things that would normally have people fighting each other for who gets what. And it was the mind space, it was the 60s mind space that comes from this underlying spiritual, metaphysical, we'll call it, which is Eastern philosophy, Chinese philosophy, spirituality. Um, and, and people in those years were very tuned to that. We were tuned to, to the, um, the, the wholeness of life, I guess. It was a holistic approach. And one of, the, it's the main, one of the things that we said was go with the flow, which means just be easy about things. If something works, then do it. If it doesn't work, then don't do it. Just don't get uptight. Nobody wants to be uptight. When you get uptight, you start getting angry at other people, even though you're really upset with the way you're behaving inside. So uh, for me, it was an example that we should, that we can achieve this effect. It's just a question of how we think. And how we think is something we should look at how they thought, how the people at Woodstock were thinking, how the so-called hippie generation was thinking. Just calling it the hippie generation is kind of a, a, a diminishing of it. It was a very wise, a very wise time in human experience. It was a renaissance of thought. And people behave like that to try and help everybody. And, and Rachel, was Woodstock the end of something, or did it begin something? Um, the, 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 the passion for activism today, did Woodstock have anything to do with that, or is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the people that I grew up with definitely focused in their own small space and took care of their families. and. Um, and I think what's something a lot of people don't necessarily realize, but when you look at these images, like everybody at Woodstock was not a hippie. Everybody didn't have long hair. A lot of people were awakened from what it looks like here. I can't speak, um, you know, but, it, but a lot of people seem to be awakened at that point. And so there's been this residual ripple that's been happening over the course. Now we've watched that in, in, in the evolution of festival culture. Um, the music uh, sort of bringing everyone together for the purpose of, at the very least, enjoying the music and maybe getting really high. So like that, that seems to be happening. The grassroots um, effort that, that, that began with the civil rights movement or continued and with the um, women's rights movement, it definitely conti it continued, but I feel like in a lot of ways there was a bit of a gap um, speaking to, and I'm gonna just say who it was today because I, you know, we're, I was talking to Ben Sebastian today, who's an amazing musician, and you know, we're, we're kind of going, hey, you guys. John Sebastian's son? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going, hey, we kind of thought that we were gonna like be, like that there 
was this amazing community that was going to hold us as we grew. And the truth is, um, it was a bit of a mirage in many ways. And so there's there's pockets, there's Elliots, and there's there's people like my mom, and there's people like my, you know, there's people like you, there's people like everyone out here in this room. I would assume sort of looking for something um, to shift, but I but but I feel like we're look we keep looking, and what I'm noticing. And I've been thinking about it a lot in the last few weeks, and it just kind of popped up as I was going to sleep recently, and I thought, wow, you know, like it's really about being the love. And if we think about what is it that everyone's really chasing? What is it about Woodstock that was so awesome? Was it the promoters? Was it the music? Was it the rain and the mud? And the, I mean, what was it that made it so awesome? And everyone I speak to says, we were there in a moment or a weekend of freedom, and no one was resisting. And now, in 2019, the, one of the biggest hashtags of 2017 and 18 was what? Resist. But like, if we keep resisting, we're gonna keep building walls to climb. And then those walls, as young people, my friend Adam Elfers, who started the, no, uh, the defund dabble movement, one young, two young guys in their early 20s caused Billions of dollars to be divested from fossil fuel infrastructure straight out of banks. So we're in this time right now where it's all yelling at us again. It's not even teasing us anymore. How are we going to make that shift? And when do we start to persist toward something different? When do we start to persist toward? The more we push against, the harder we're going to be pushing. So I'm actually just threw up a website like yesterday, and I haven't even, you're the first people are hearing about it, B, B, E, dash, in, I, N, dot, love, not dot com, dot, love, B, in, love, and I am calling a global B, in, because you know what, some people aren't going to make it to Watkins Glen, maybe nobody, some people aren't going to make it to over to Bethel, where I hope to be. Some people aren't going to make it out of their houses, but if you can tune into the energy, right? It was energy moves faster than matter, so let's make this energy matter. And let's take this conversation from, oh no, the millennials want to hear rap. That's not Woodstock. Guess what? Michael Lang and the other three producers... What did they do? They took the hottest bands of the time and they threw them in the middle of a field with way too many people and they tried an experiment and look what happened. And Michael's tried to do it a few times. And so now here we are with the opportunity to hold that torch while we're holding each other's hands, right? Like here it is, like here's three generations right here having this conversation. Yeah. And we could break this up with some music soon too. Oh my it looks like Elliot wants to say something to make it quick because I want to hear some music. I'll try and make it quick. First of all, that I interviewed your dad, and he, he said that that Woodstock is not one festival; that that it's an ongoing thing. That in every pocket of all the things you're you're saying is happening. It's happening in little bits and pieces. This was maybe 20 years ago I interviewed him, but it's in my book, the uh, a transcription of the interview. I can't really repeat it. But he also told me that when he was, he was looking out at the audience, he saw freedom. And that's where the song came from. So that saw freedom, everyone was free there. And, and uh, the, the, so what I'd like to do is, is maybe make that interview, on, put that interview on your website if you want it for that. Because it really, yeah, it really belongs there. Because he really defined what's happening there and he understands it. And he put it in very beautiful words. So I have a video of it, but also you do a transcription. And, so it belongs there. Okay. And, and then the other thing that I want to say that I think is very important, that years ago I, was, I began photographing peace demonstrations and then I did the rock music and the rock music was for me a proselytizing because all the musicians were against the war. And when you went down to the film where you should smoke grass and you danced any way you wanted to dance and you became free and became part of this culture. So when I was, when I was showing these pictures, I felt like I was inviting people, come on down and be part of this new way of thinking, this new way of being. And then at some point, I didn't want to take these pictures anymore. I didn't want to do music photographs. I didn't want to do peace demonstrations. And I said, I, I, this is not right. I should be doing my part to stop 
all this from happening. And then I read to, to be against the bad things that are happening in the world, to stop, to stop the war and so on. And then I read in a spiritual metaphysical book that if you're fighting evil, if you spend all your time fighting evil, then you've lost because evil has won and taken your time. So I think that's what Rachel's talking about now. Yeah, because we can do it. And this is the thing, look, music heals. We figured that out, right? And if we're gonna look into the movement into now, when I look, when I spend time with the young people, they're like this. Make music, make art, make love, care about each other, stop fighting over gender binary issues, um, make a painting, sing a song. What can you do to add to the movement? It's going to come from your creativity. And that's definitely what the young people and what the young people are still telling us. The young here, people here. right next to me and the young people right next to me. Um, we, yeah. will, we will have questions and answers after our music. Yeah. But uh, Rachel, you want to... I mean, I, I guess. I, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to be the introducer, but <laughs> if we're going to go from a bridge generation to the bridge generation, and we're supposed to be building bridges now, not walls, um, we're going to take a third generation Woodstocker right now. Chogi Lama is my son, and he's a badass, and I don't think he's going to play Freedom. <laughs> 